and start the the large screen. Can you see this? Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is. But it's got the interface just saying. <laughs> uh -huh. If you if you want just the slides. You mean this, the upper part? Yeah, it, it's got a whole interface of the application, the, the usual problem we had. No. <laughs> Again? So it, it, it's not the whole screen thing? Nope. At least not for me. <laughs> yeah, for me it's the same. The whole PowerPoint yes. app yeah. is visible. OK. Um, let's see if um, I can maybe. How does long dot? I always have if we, problems. If we've got two screens, maybe you're sharing the wrong one. Uh, I think you can change that in Zoom settings um, on the top of the screen. How about Which... now? Still the same, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but now it should have... work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. So okay, this this will be just a brief introduction of the author and the book itself. Uh, I've read the, this is the third time I'm reading this book, so I know a little bit about it. Uh, and I would just like to uh, give you a bit of a feel for the book and uh, what we're getting ourselves into. So first, a few words about Jean-Pierre Dupuis. Uh, he's basically the first author that we are reading within the context of Epoche, who is still alive. Uh, he was born in Paris in 1941, and as I said, he's uh, still not deceased, which is nice. Um, he was educated in uh, at Ecole Polytechnique and Ecole des Mines, and he was working in uh, both in France and in the States. Um, in, in the States, he taught French language and linguistics, and in France, he taught social and political philosophy and ethics of technology. He was also the founder or one of the founders of the famous centers, Center of Cognitive Sciences and Epistemology, um, which was founded in 1982 at Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, so I, again, just a you know, very brief introduction so that we know who, who wrote this book. This is the book in question. Uh, on the left side, you see the, the French original version, and then there were two versions that were published in English language. So the French original was published in 1994, which is not not completely irrelevant because as you will see, you know, uh, it, with regards to some of the things, uh, the book might seem slightly dated. Yeah, but still it's very, very pertinent, especially because of its main emphasis. And the book, the, the two English translations are from 2000 and 2009. Now the genre, the, ge the general genre of the of uh, the book is intellectual history, or as uh, the author himself puts it, uh, ecology. Sometimes also history of ideas, and it's a very interesting book because it's not uh, what you might call um, a prototypical scholarly treatise, but it is um, a, a book that contains a lot of philosophical reflection while accounting for and presenting certain ideas. So it, it, it can, Dupuis somehow manages to do this in a very brilliant and intriguing way. Um, so as already hinted at, the, the book is layered. It consists of several different layers. Uh, the surfal, surface layer basically consists of just presentation of the cybernetic movement, which in and of itself might seem quite boring or maybe of interest to, to some uh, historians of science or something like that. But uh, the book is much more than that. Um, at some point, uh, Dupuis says that the book is a reproachment of apparently irreconcilable, irreconcilable traditions. Uh, so he, what he's trying to do with this book is overcoming the schizophrenia that is currently prevalent in certain uh, or even most academic circles. And this schizophrenia that he's referring to is this strange split between what he refers to in the, in the introduction as French intellectualism on the one side and American ac academism on the other side. So he's trying to creatively combine these two approaches that have developed their own unique thought styles, their own unique uh, manners and modes of uh, approaching problems and issues and talking about them and thinking about them. So 
again, also in this regard, it's, it's a strange book because you will find uh, different authors that you normally don't find uh, side by side. So Heidegger in dialogue with Fodor and so on and so forth. A lot of these uh, uh, somewhat uh, strange uh, constellations can be found in this book. It's also an interesting book because it constantly combines concrete and the general. So it moves from concrete to the general and back again in the sense of that it's it's drawing on concrete scientific models and on scientific, very concrete uh, um, theoretical uh, uh, models proposed by, by, by uh, developed within a certain scientific discipline, and then moves on to the level of philosophical reflection. And from that particular level of philosophical reflection goes back to these models. And he just creates this movement that, for example, Husserl refers to when he talks about a zigzag movement that you should do. So it's also very interesting uh, in, in that, that regard. And in general, Dupuy, as you will see shortly, or you might have already kind of um, had a bit of a foretaste in, this, uh, in these two prefaces, he has a unique style of presenting ideas. Like uh, <laughs> he, he, he's always kind of approaching issues from a slightly, uh, from a position that is slightly askew. So it is neither completely in the realm of what you would say a full-blown philosophical reflection, nor does he just, you know, narrate a certain, let's say, uh, uh, his, he, he does not provide a certain historical narrative or what have you. But he's always somewhere in between, and he does it very skillfully. Um, uh, there are quite a lot of authors who are trying to do this, but not many of them succeed. I think that Dupuy, at least in this particular book, manages to do this quite nicely. And he says somewhere in the book uh, at the very beginning that the, the, the translator had an important role here as well, because he was constantly kind of uh, um, uh, forcing him to, to articulate certain things in a clearer manner. So let's start with why this book was written. The best way to introduce this basically is through the two authors uh, that this book is dedicated to. So the two authors that uh, Dupuy uh, dedicated this book to, uh, one is Heinz von Förster on the left, and the other one is probably a slightly less, lesser known figure, Jean Ulmo on the right. So let's start with Heinz von Förster. Uh, Dupuy says that he met Heinz von Förster in 1976 and that he was introduced via von Förster to the second order cybernetics. And one can see already from these early uh, pages that he's quite enamored, quite fascinated by, by the second or, uh, or, uh, cybernetic movement. Uh, through this particular movement, he also came in touch with Henry Otlan, which is probably, again, uh, uh, um, somewhat less known nowadays, and Francisco Varela, whom we've already mentioned on several occasions. Um, and uh, uh, through Otlan and Varela, uh, uh, Dupuy uh, uh, came into touch came into contact with the idea of self-organizing systems, which he found conceptually very intriguing and uh, uh, an interesting opposition to what was being developed in, in the prevalent cognitive science circles. Uh, he also mentions two conferences that he organized on these topics at the beginning of the 80s. And this then translates directly into the role played by uh, Ulmo, uh, who was his teacher uh, and who was integral in, in uh, uh, establishing the aforementioned uh, CREA at Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. Um, and the reason why Ulmo was so important is because he and Dupuy, they, they, uh, they created this center, which was crucial for the development of cognitive science and related sciences in France, but it was done in a manner that was very methodologically a plural. So there was a plurality of approaches and paradigms that they were toying around with in this particular at this particular center, which was in contrast again to what was being done in the U.S. And uh, as you will see, this is something that is very important for for Dupuy. Now, uh, a good entryway into why the why question of the book is this particular quote that is merely alluded to uh, by Dupuy in the text. 
It's by Alfred North Whitehead, uh, and it is from uh, a, a, a pretty unknown text, uh, which is an address to British Association from 1916. Uh, Whitehead uh, said, says in this text that a science which hesitates to forget its founders is lost. Basically, Dupuis is opposed to this idea. He disagrees with this idea. The, 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 the main reason or why he decided to write this book is because not knowing for him, not knowing one's history um, is um, problematic, potentially even disastrous. So to begin with, it, it puts a break on one's creativity because if you know, know your history, then you're able to uh, look at uh, you can you're able to revive certain old ideas that ha might have uh, somehow ended uh, uh, at the dust in the dustbin of history, but are still interesting and useful. And you can also uh, have a fresh look on the ideas that are currently present. So history allows you to see what is currently being developed from a new perspective. But above all. And this is the crucial thing for Dupuis. Knowing your history, uh, uh, in contrast to the famous saying that this is not the case, uh, for Dupuis means that you are able to uh, avoid repeating the errors that were being done in the past. And he draws an analogy with personal life, between personal life and ecology uh, of ideas, saying that in the latter, the same holds true as in the former. So in the personal life, you know, you you uh, if you know your own history, if you know the 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 the, the patterns that you get your, yourself entangled in regularly, will perhaps allow you to identify them now and maybe break through them in the future. Okay, let us move from why to what. So the main subject of inquiry, as you might have already um, realized by now, is cybernetics. So especially the first order cybernetics, and we will get into the distinction between first order and second order cybernetics uh, as we progress. Why is cybernetics so interesting to Dupuis? First reason is because it is the root of cognitive science and many of its disciplines. Also, for example, certain developments in the field of theoretical and philosophical biology. It, is, it was a very clearly articulated metaphysical research program. This is the, the, uh, the, the, the phrase taken from Popper uh, that uh, Dupuis uses. And not only was it clearly articulated, but it, it, was, it was a project that also clearly proved to be false. It, uh, the, the story of cybernetics, says Dupuis, is a story of failure. Uh, and by knowing this story, we can disabuse some of the current approaches in cognitive science from uh, making similar mistakes. So it's, it's a bit of a warning story as well. So the, the ongoing theme, the, the maxim that we will be constantly re returning to is that the cybernetics movement was not the movement that tried to humanize the machine that is to say, it is not the movement that tried to ask, could we uh, um, create a machine that is able to perform human cognition, that is possible to, to uh, carry out human cognition or, or uh, uh, instantiate human cognition, but quite the opposite. It is the, uh, uh, about the mechanization of the mind. So cybernetic movement try to mechanize the mind. And um, as we will see next week, uh, for Dupuis, cybernetic is not the culmination of humanism, which is a critique uh, um, directed against uh, cybernetics by Heidegger, but is precisely its opposite. It is the deconstruction of humanism, and it is the um, pinnacle of anti-humanism. But there is a, a larger or a broader philosophical interest behind this study of cybernetics. So um, Dupuis says that he's interested in what he refers to as the autonomy of the soul. I don't think that we have to take him literally here, but just this idea that there is something 
uh, as an autonomy of a human person or autonomy of the mind. And he thinks that, you know, that, 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 that uh, the, the general approach of cybernetics, which tries to mechanize the mind, is undermining or eroding this uh, aspect, which for him is extremely important. So the study of cybernetics for him is a study of the a study that is related in a very important sense uh, to the study of the origins of the materialist slash mechanicist conception of the mind. And his point in this book will be that in order for us to be able to understand what uh, cyberneticians were trying to do, we will have to understand the broader horizon, the broader intellectual atmosphere in which they were operating and in particular very specific uh, metaphysical presuppositions about knowledge about subjectivity and the world so if we want to understand the the original impetus that lies behind what what cyberneticians were doing we need to understand its metaphysical epistemological underpinnings and also Another thing that he will be interested in that he will constantly be kind of toying around with in his presentation is, are there any alternatives to this approach? And he will basically try to show that already within the cybernetic movement itself, which as he points out, is not a homo homogeneous movement, although it is sometimes depicted as such, uh, we find different approaches and different views. So he will specifically contrast the approach of Wiener to von Neumann. Wiener will be uh, uh, a paradigmatic example of someone who is um, um, putting most stress on the notions of design and control, whereas von Neumann will constantly try to emphasize the importance of complexity and self-organization. Okay, and then uh, in the later preface, he is then kind of trying to point out some of the uh, implications of, of this particular approach uh, to recent developments in different fields. So he starts this particular preface, the, the later preface, on a rather pessimistic note, saying that recent developments have not in any way uh, uh, negated what he says in this book, but have merely confirmed the pessimism of his conclusions uh, conclusions and justified the gloominess of his outlook. Uh, and he says that what we are witnessing currently in, in, in the contemporary uh, climate uh, is not some sort of an intellectual evolution, although sometimes it is presented in this way. For Dupuy, basically we are witnessing the same intellectual paradoxes, the same conceptual structures that are were present already during the cybernet, uh, cybernetics era, but they are materialized in new technologies. So it's basically uh, the old wine in the new skins. Um, and these new technologies basically have way more serious consequences, which is... Uh, uh, much more problematic in, in many other ways. So one of these recent developments is the so-called NBIC convergence. NBIC stands for nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, cognitive science. So uh, Dupuy presents this NBIC conglomerate as something, as one of these recent technological de developments that have grown out of the same conceptual substrate and he neatly summarizes what uh, the, the, the main idea, the, the, the central idea of this NBIC uh, movement is with the following credo. If the cognitive science can think it, the nano people can build it, the bio people can implement it, and the IT people can monitor and control it. Uh, and he says, we see that cognitive science uh, here still plays the role of the thinker, of the metaphysician, the one that is kind of leading the intellectual way, and the other people are then just implementing it. 
all this to say that we still have certain uh, specific modes, styles of thought that have already been developed um, during the, 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 the cyber the cybernetician era and they they are still present and they're just still kind of guiding this uh development uh and then we have this uh paradox of our age as he puts it and all these references to hannah arendt and also to her first husband gunther others uh, anders um i think that the main idea and the main point that uh, Dupuy is trying to put across here is uh, neatly captured in this quote uh, by Arendt, or, uh, taken from Arendt's text. Whereas the power of mankind to alter its environment goes on increasing under the stimulus of technological progress, less and less do we find ourselves in a position to control the consequences of our actions. So there is this strange dichotomy or a strange tension between the capacity to have a greater and greater control over technological development, but lesser and lesser control over what this technology can do. So there is an uprise in design, but at the same time, a certain counter movement in the direction of self-organization of what is being designed. Uh, and Dupuy, in, in a very ingenious manner, I would say, uh, uh, relates this to what Günther Anders uh, refers to as Promethean shame. <laughs> so Promethean shame refers to this uh, problem of a human being, uh, human, human beings who seem to be ashamed to have been born instead of made. That is to say, this uh, precariousness that is integrated into the very essence of all living beings is something that is problematic for a living being that is capable of self-reflection self -reflection and rational scrutiny. So in a certain sense, the, the hu human being strives towards building a ground for itself that he or she would him or herself design. But the interesting paradox in this is that once you achieve this, you in a certain sense make human being obsolete because the, the, the impulse, the creative impulse, the impulse coming from the, the, the origin of freedom in a human being, which, which is uh, precisely the impulse that directs these activities of trying to erect a certain ground, uh, becomes eroded or eliminated when this ground is created. So if you have a design that is able to create a human being, it is precisely that which negates or annuls the, the impulse that is giving birth to this particular ground. So uh, Dupuy is kind of toying on this uh, tension and it will be it will resurface in the first chapter. Okay, and the, the, the second technological manifestation uh, uh, of, of uh, some of the things that he's writing in this book is synthetic biology, which, as we've mentioned, should be of interest to many people uh, attending this. Uh, so this attempt to make life from scratch, as he puts it. And again, he's kind of toying around with what exactly is it that synthetic biology is doing? And he's drawing on, on the distinction that I alluded to before, where, where he says that Cybernet cyberneticians didn't try to humanize the machine, but they tried to mechanize the mind. And he would say that something similar is being done in synthetic biology. It is not trying to create life, but it is trying to erase life in the sense of that it is trying to reconceptual life, life in a way where the distinction between living and non-living that is fundamental to basically almost uh, all the conceptual edifices in which human beings live will just become, you know, a, a non-distinction. Um, and he calls it uh, a logic of dreams and says that in the darkness of dreams, there is no difference between a living cat and a dead cat. And we can get to that maybe. Uh, and the final thing that I would maybe like to point out here is he says that um, 
scientists usually wear two hats. One, one hat is the hat of vainglory, where they really pride themselves of just doing, you know, this revolutionary uh, work where they just, you know, create new stuff. And the other hat is the hat of false pride. And he says that it is the false pride that is most worrisome because uh, when the scientist is, when the scientist puts on the, the hat of the false pride, he would just say, but I'm not doing anything spe special. So if somebody confronts that scientist and says, but you're basically eroding or erasing life, and this can have serious implications on so many different levels, this scientist will defend him or herself in a way where, where he or her, herself will say, I'm just doing science as usual. I'm just doing what science was always doing. And that is basically eroding essential distinctions because there is a certain very specific metaphysical and epistemological outlook that is informing uh, uh, um, most of scientific approaches and endeavors. Uh, and again, he's trying to say that here we have a new technology, synthetic biology, uh, or a new approach, but in a certain sense, it's still deeply steeped into some of the debates that he will try to present in this particular book. Okay, so this is the short intro into the book and the author. And uh, now we can discuss the, the formalities if you want, Tarja, or if we've already agreed that you and Andrea would present the chapter one, then we can maybe skip that. Oh yeah, sure, we can skip that. I mean, if, if you are willing to grant us uh, the possibility to talk about models <laughs> yeah, on the sure. basis of our very long, long research trajectory together, precisely Marvelous. addressing models. So that's why we were so intrigued by, you know, talking precisely on this chapter. Yeah, yeah, super. I, I, I will put you uh, into the uh, on, on into the Excel spreadsheet today Good. already, so you're there. And Michael, we will just uh, find another slot for you. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I'm not happy with that. Okay. Okay. So that's the intro. <laughs> Any uh, ideas or impressions or reflections? critiques or what have you. I just got one question. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah. Tara, is it okay? If, uh, sure, Adam, yes. I mean, no problem whatsoever. Okay. Just go ahead. Okay, I don't know. Okay, it's, it's really short. Uh, you mentioned two prefaces. So I assume the second one is from the newer English translation because I only got one here. <laughs> Yeah, that that's that's true. Uh, there are two prefaces in at least in this particular book that I have. I'm I'm hoping that you have this one as well. Otherwise, but I'm assuming that this is the case. Uh, and the second one is from the 2005. Uh, ah, okay. So Michael, you don't have that particular preface where they talk about synthetic biology and stuff. The the there there's only one preface in this book. Okay, I've got. But there, I just went and read the second one in the in the PDF that you saw. Ah, okay, 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 okay. So this one's the Princeton one, and I think the MIT one is the, the is the more recent one. That yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the MIT one. I think that this is the one that we have in the PDF form, right? Um. Okay, Tarja. I will now. I'm unmuted. So maybe there are some like I, I I was really intrigued by this introduction. It was like at the same time so insightful, and at point at some points I thought, well, you know, that's a little bit weird, but that's probably very French that you so freely put all kinds of discourses together and kind of make them to fit, but you still start to feel that maybe it's not such a good fit, but it doesn't matter actually in the end of the day because it's exciting. But so what I found really, I mean, apart from the things that you discussed there in your introduction, uh, so what I found really interesting was what this uh, physicist Kelly, he was referring to this physicist Kelly, who was then saying something like, um, 
it took us a long time to realize that the power of a technology is proportional to its inherent out of controlness, its inherent ability to surprise and be generative. In fact, unless we can worry about technology, it's not revolutionary enough. I found this really interesting. I mean, it apart from obviously relating to synthetic biology, so very many things that Dupuy is like pointing out here are, are actually nowadays even more acute, like when it comes to synthetic biology. But then I was thinking about social media. I mean, if, if you think about like algorithms, so there is a sense in which, I mean, much of that is out of control. And precisely because of that, it's revolutionary because I mean, it, it's not in the control of anybody. And, and in a funny way, like that's its design feature to be out of control, like all the time being adaptive. So it's designed be, to be adaptive to our choices, you know, constantly updating itself, but that also makes it so like uh, out of control. So, I mean, that was to me, amazing insight actually here. And obviously then I was, yeah, I was really impressed by the way in which he was um, underlying the importance of studying failures, because that is precisely what like, especially philosophy of science often is doing. We just like uh, study successful science. We don't study failures. We don't study that much of where something fails. And probably then because we study successes, we want to render very many things uh, into successes. Like only something that is successful is actually like valuable. And here it does seem to me that like this is a very different approach in which you find something that is a failure, very interesting to study. Yeah, with regards to this last thing, I would just like to point out that this is again a very uh, uh, Frenchy thing, you might say. So people who have been kind of forged in the French tradition of his history and epistemology of science are perhaps somewhat more, um, uh, have a better sense for this, for the importance, epistemological importance of failures. And maybe just uh, two people who are worth mentioning in this regard. One is uh, more well-known, Conguilem, and then the other one is Helen Metzger, um, a less well-known, uh, an interesting historian of science. I'll just put her name in, in the, the, the text. And she was also emphasizing the importance of studying failures and uh, the epistemological relevance of, of breaks, breaks and uh, um, unsuccessful theories and hypotheses and it also goes to a certain degree back to Bachelard and either agreeing with him or uh, being counter to him but yeah I definitely agree Tarja this is like a for me this was also <laughs> a really interesting point when I when I started studying the the French epistemologists and historians of science more closely and uh uh this emphasis on uh, uh failures and also on the breaks so they, they are big on breaks and on failures anomalies <laughs> and breaks and jumps and all this this is like a, a huge thing uh in the french tradition any other comments reflections on this Maybe I can still point out that like um, about this humanism discussion. So somehow he seems to be at least partially anticipate all these like uh, um, discussions about post-humanism that now seems to be so en vogue <laughs> everywhere. So, you know, at least I mean, to my mind when I was reading this, I was like, aha, uh -huh, okay, I can, I can see a line from here to this post-humanist discussions on technology and like, human agency. Yeah, for sure. And this will be like a central topic in, in already the, the introduction, the, the question of humanism and uh, anti-humanism. And then, you know, directly related to post-humanism as well.
yeah, anybody else with, with regards to these interesting topics that Daria brought up? In one of the things here that um, I personally found very interesting is precisely this thing that you mentioned, Daria, the not only creating technology that can do a lot of stuff, but that is of such a nature in a certain sense that is able to uh, transcend the the, the, the capacity of us to 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 even be able to predict what that technology is able to do and to to constantly surprise with with new things uh, so that realizing precisely this that until you have created a technology that is able to completely div divest yourself itself from uh, from its designer, you haven't really properly created artificial intelligence or life, say. Um, so yeah, this is uh, an interesting thing, and also the the, the dialectical twists that that Dupuy will be constantly playing with with this idea of what it means to create this, as you will see in the in the next <laughs> chapter introduction. Yeah, Michael. Uh, I, I too, am just very impressed. <laughs> and there's something very refreshing I find about his particular style, and one that he himself reflects on that that trying to straddle the the difference between the rigor or the yeah the the tightness of analytic stuff and and the 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 looseness of continental stuff and um, the French intellectualism and the American academicism. And there's something very refreshing in, in, in that space for real movement of thought and reflection on this. That, And then it comes out for me, like you said, in all these different layers, like he's able to talk about something as, as, detailed as uh, a scientific model of mind and then and then go through all these layers to society to religion and to um, inviting us to consider the different level like what kind of problem is this that we're engaging with at these different levels um, and and thereby giving a really like, I guess what I appreciate is, is that it's writing that moves me intellectually, but also as a, as a human that um, when talking about models of mind, I think it's easy to, to stay distanced. Um, but I like that there's a certain invitation to participation and moral participation. Like this is, um, and and I, I feel like he's sensitive to this deeply too. Like he just had tons of tons of really good quotes. One in particular that I liked was, um, "I'm less disturbed by a science that claims to be um, to be the equal of God than a science that drains of all meaning one of the most essential distinctions known to humanity since the moment it first came into existence." The distinction between that which lives and that which does not, or to speak more bluntly, between life and death. It's like to like to have that in the context of of like a movement of about a conception of mind. You're like, are we really? Is this really what's at stake? And he's like, yeah. Um, and then our relationship, and then somewhere towards the end, um, that. Uh, I very much fear that the spontaneous ontology of those who wish to set themselves up as the makers or recreators of the world know nothing of the beings who inhabit it, only a host of characteristics. If the nanotech dream were ever to come true, 
what still today we call love would become incomprehensible. Right? That there's a there's a humanism there, and, and or in the sense of like, oh, let's not let's remember what matters. Um, and when we're drawing lines and defining what a mind is, we are including some things and excluding others, and and uh, the matterings and that line drawing and his sense for that really come out in a way that I appreciate and, and speak to me. I don't know. I, I don't know if anybody else feels the same way. I mean, yeah, for sure. That that's that's also one of the reasons why I I uh, suggested that we have this particular reading group because it. Uh, I think that the the term ecology of ideas is very fitting because it precisely conveys this. Um, notion or idea of having a complex system within which you have specific ideas almost as nodes within these dynamical systems that are constantly uh, co-determining each other. So when you're, for example, studying the cybernetics movement, you cannot really understand the cybernetics movement, the specifics of the cybernetics movement without understanding the larger ideational horizon out of which it kind of came to be. And this larger ideational horizon is a very specific metaphysical thought style which is to say a very specific mode of looking at very fundamental things about what you know what knowing means what a human being is how are human beings related to the world like very fundamental things so he's kind of constantly drawing these or kind of bringing forth these loops ongoing loops, as I said, between the concrete and the general. And he's able to do this, I don't know, very skillfully, where he just kind of, you know, goes through three paragraphs and you've moved from a very specific thing in the context of cybernetics and then talking about theology and metaphysics and whether, you know, love <laughs> still makes sense in, in this particular climate and back again. Um, on you. Does it? Does any of that bother you? That uh, the way he moves with his thought. I mean, I can imagine a lot of analytic philosophers will be pissed off by it or be bothered by it. <laughs> I mean, I was thinking when I read this chapter, uh, something that uh, sparked my interest was precisely this distinction between living and non-living. Uh, he puts it really dramatically, like that contemporary science is about to erase this, this, this distinction entirely. And this is supposed to be somehow very um, threatening or something. I mean, it is uh, in, in, in a way, but what, what I was thinking is that I'm not really sure what he means by this. I, I think there could be at least two different uh readings and they're probably somehow related but that was that would be my question to all of you so so the, the two readings or the two um meanings of this erasure could be like in one sense it, it could be like a, a, a just a, a sort of epistemic erasure in the sense that you're unable to notice the difference between the living and non-living you're not un un unable to discern it in your sci scientific theories so you start from a kind of a mechanistic conception of the universe where you're not able to draw this distinction significantly, right? You're not able to define what a living being is. Uh, and in another sense, there's this technological uh, register, which he puts it, uh, I mean, Dupuis talks about that a kind of technological erasure of the living in the sense that, whereas in the first epistemic sense, he seems to be like a very skeptical about the um, reach of science, let's say, and in the technological, he, he puts his, his overly, uh, he draws uh, a picture of, a, of science uh, like a very, uh, like an, hmm, what's the word? Like omnipotent, like, the, like, like a very omnipotent um, picture of what science can do. Like it could make us immortal, it could, it could intervene technologically into our bodies, do whatever it wants with us, right? 
So that would be uh, the other kind of erasure where you, you erase the distinction by technologically erasing what life was, um, making yourself something, something, uh, something different. So, I, so first of all, I, I don't know where he's, where exactly he's pointing towards in this technological sense, like what he's, what he's, what concretely he's imagining that this technological threat would be. And in the other, uh, the other thing which I find interesting in how, is how these two meanings interrelate. Like if this would be, if somebody has any comments. Well, uh, one of the things, Michael, you asked about whether there is something that can be frustrating about this particular manner of conveying ideas, right? Well, one of the things, I don't know if you've noticed this because I know you read the book as well, uh, is that sometimes when you read Dupuy, and I think Timothy brought this out pretty nicely, you have the impression that in these dialectical twists and loops, as is often the case with French authors, he also creates like these small cracks out of which sometimes certain things kind of flow out. Uh, and uh, very often when you think about what he was, what he tried to say, you're not really sure, you know, whether there, there are several ways that you can kind of approach a certain something and you have the impression that he might have sometimes conflated certain ideas. Uh, so it's a uh, quite um, equivocal in what, what he's trying to do with, with some of the notions. And I think that this is actually a good point, uh, the, the one that Timothy is making. So whether erasing life means having an uh, epistemological or metaphysical theory, which has no room for the distinction between life and non-life. Uh, so a, a mechanistic conception uh, of the world, yeah? Where basically you cannot really draw a meaningful distinction. So you might, you have to say that life is ultimately reducible to non life. Or whether the development of technology is moving in the direction of eroding this distinction, because with the technological improvement, you're able to say, you know, somehow bring about immortality, which erodes the distinction between life and death. In my view, from the way I understood Dupuy, I think that what he's trying to say is it is because there is an underlying current of this specific metaphysical worldview that people start toying around, around with the ideas that they are able to create technologies that will achieve this. I don't know if he would be willing to claim it, that it is impossible to do so, but it would seem that there is a strong correlation between having this idea of um, just, you know, life being part of the, of the larger world system that can be understood clearly and manipulated in a very, very rigorous way. And in doing so, you're able to also basically transcend life itself so the limitations imposed on you by the life itself so a certain transhumanist ideal where you know you will you will be able to erode life from within itself <laughs> uh or or free recognition free mind uh understood in a very uh algorithmic sense from the precariousness of the organic But that, that was also a French way of putting it. And I have the impression that as I was doing it, I simply kind of <laughs> repeated to the same thing that Dupuy did. I created cracks out of which the, the, the clear statement <laughs> kind of evaporated. But anyway, any other thoughts on this? <laughs> I, I like the question, Timothy. Thank you. I, 
I'm not sure this is much of a, an answer, so much of a, I guess, a response that you stimulated. But yeah, I don't know whether it, it, it I don't know whether it's epistemic or technological or, or what. Um, but I'm thinking like ab about the way, for example, for minds and consciousness or whatever we do, we're like, oh, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions? That, list of characteristics that the Dupree talks about you know? that's what I'm thinking about when he's pointing to that he's like oh we can we can identify you know that, that he's he's suggesting that that some of these that those who wish to set themselves up as the makers or recreators of the world imagine that if we identify the list of necessary and sufficient characteristics of mind that we might be able to build one and, and recreate it and um, Oh, and then he's saying, you know, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for love? And you're like, and 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 then for me, it's kind of a performative or a, an enacted irony that, like, oh, you know, if we we name the thing, uh, kind of getting lost in the map. And losing the territory, kind of thing. Um, but I yeah, losing sense that this is. I've kind of I've lost my train of thought here. It was a valid try, Michael. <laughs> So, uh, Pia, would you like to summarize this, uh, or? Yeah, I mean, not really. That's why I um, <laughs> posted it there. But but I found this uh, in a book about uh, evolution, and they were criticizing this. So this is um, some huge microbiologist statement in a magazine. Uh, so I saved it because it seemed relevant. So what's the what's the crucial point here because yeah a lot of text so maybe if somebody has already read it can summarize it for me it's kind of interesting this how, why is humanism like presupposed to be the good thing and this anti-humanist technological is sort of put in like a, a bad position or a I don't know I, I, I don't know if it's like really discussed it, it probably will be because I think that's his position but I'm not sure if it's really argumented well because maybe I'm just I, I have just read enough texts of people praising uh, anti-humanism as something good, not something to be like uh, feared. So it's, um, for me, it's interesting that it's not really explained why this, even like this erasure of life with technology. So maybe changing life with technology is per se bad. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a two-layered response to this response to this from Dupuis would be as follows. The first thing is he is actually the background he's coming from is precisely the background that you said uh, is kind of uh, depicted as bad. So he's coming from the French milieu where anti-humanism was, you know, predominant. In a certain sense, this text is throwing down the glove glove to his French colleagues. So he's basically showing them the middle finger in a certain sense. I'm going to defend personal, you know, uh, humanism against all the anti-humanist background that has developed in France. And this will become clear in the introduction. So for him, basically, the, the, the default state or stance is precisely anti-humanism. So he, he, he's not approaching it from, but his own position is humanist. But he's kind of uh, defending it in a climate that is 
critical to 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 humanism but in the preface i think it says the the anti-humanism he's like he's coming from is anti-humanism from structuralism right yes so it's not like technological but it's i mean i'm, I'm not sure because i'm not a big knower of structuralism but like societal structures and just structures no 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 his his point will be that structuralism is basically a strange synthesis that has developed uh where you have strong influences from let's say people like heidegger and also influences from the cybernetician cybernetics tradition so his point will be that the french anti-humanism is this strange constellation of these two things and what the the the, the so to to kind of give give a bit of a teaser one of his arguments against anti-humanism would be that the more you have an attempt to mechanize the mind the more you underscore the importance and centrality of mechanizing the mind so there is a mind which mechanizes when it tries to mechanize the mind so the more you are able to build structures or models that mechanize the mind the more you are basically validating that there is a certain element of mindedness that is able to do this which in a certain sense is escaping this so what you get in this process is always a duality almost like a 50 and duality of of an ego that is trying to objectify itself but in doing so it's always the one doing the objectifying so the more you do it <laughs> the more you kind of underscore precisely what you're trying to undermine so that that will be one of one of his main points that he will be trying to to put forward here it's 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 in a certain sense he would say probably philosophically naive you just have to kind of bracket you 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 you're not you're not putting yourself into the picture or into the story so the the, the mind that is mechanizing is left by wayside the only thing that there is there is mechanized mind however when you're doing this you are basically creating very powerful tools and developments that allow you to think about yourself differently in a way that is potentially dangerous and whatnot and blah 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 and we, we will get into this but that's one of the things that he will be constantly kind of bringing to the fore um yeah Okay, so any further reflections? I know, maybe from other people, Gregor, Primoz, Katarina. Now we can also leave some of the stuff for, for next time, which is already next week, by the way. Yeah, this is the the only exception so we will have uh just uh this meeting and the next meeting will be like two weeks in a row and then we have meetings every second week yeah so what do you say we wrap up for today okay then thanks to everyone who attended uh Hopefully we're in for some interesting discussions further down the line. Uh, Trimoj, you wanted to say something? No, no. <laughs> I was getting ready to say bye. <laughs> ah, yeah, okay, okay. Then I'll be seeing you next week and enjoy your weekend, yeah? Gregor, we probably see each other next week. See you soon, thanks. Yeah, cheers. Bye-bye.